Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. You could chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please keep, click the ellipse icon with the three dots labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A for the benefit of those on the phone. I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. If you have a technical issue during the presentation, please have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoTo webinar button will take you to uh, the YouTube link. With that said, I'd like to introduce uh, today's presenter, Karen Wetzel is the manager of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education Framework for Cybersecurity, where she leads the efforts for advancing, improving, and applying the framework in support of an integrated ecosystem of cybersecurity education, training, and workforce development. She specializes in community engagement and collaborating with stakeholders and subject matter experts to identify, communicate, and develop guidance tools and resources to address emerging trends and opportunities. Prior to joining NICE, she was the director of the Community Groups and Working Groups Program at Educase and served as a program manager for the National Information Standards Organization. Karen? Thank you so much, Philip, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me here, and, and thanks to all of you for joining me today. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share about this and, and to be able to discuss with you about what your workforce needs are and, and understanding how the NICE framework might be able to help um, as Philip just shared, I am a manager of the workforce framework or for cybersecurity, otherwise known as the NICE framework. And, and so essentially what I'll be sharing with you about today is what the framework is and how it can be used and happy to answer any questions you have either throughout, um, you know, within the presentation or uh, we'll save some time at the end as well for some questions. Let's see if I can, there we go. It, so just to get us started, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a context about uh, where the NICE framework is and, and where our organization is. So NICE is a program within NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology under Commerce. And we were established in 2014, although some of this work uh, actually predates that as, as it had started off as very much an interagency effort. And the NICE framework, which I'll be focusing on today, was first published as a NIST publication in 2017. 
Uh, it's important to note that our mission, NICE is not just about the NICE framework. We do more than that. Um, our mission is to energize, promote, and coordinate a robust community working together to advance an integrated ecosystem of education, training, and workforce development. And I see that Ruth is having some trouble hearing. I want to make sure others can hear me all right. Okay. It does look like others are able to hear. Oh. It's a mix, mixed bag here. Okay, good. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help everybody with uh, right. the technical Great. issues. Great, thank you so much. So I'll continue. I just wanted to make sure um, I was coming through. Awesome. So I, it is really, I think that ecosystem is really what's uh, key to a lot of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, when we talk about the NICE framework and about uh, cybersecurity workforce, we're not just thinking of it only from an employer perspective or only from a training perspective. It's really about all of the different components that come together in that ecosystem to be able to support this. And that's what the, where the NICE framework fits as well. It, it sort of brings together, um, you know, government, academia, private sector, and becomes that sort of common language that supports all of this so that we can have that, that clear communication. Um, some of the nice focus areas are, and this is again to sort of showing that what we do here at NICE is not just the framework, but um, it, they, these are in support of, and, and the framework sort of fits into each of these focus areas as well. Um, career discovery, we engage with K-12 in, in that space as well as beyond uh, education and training at all levels, uh, workforce planning and hiring, and in career development. And, and to give some context to where we come from in terms of why a workforce framework for cybersecurity, one of the uh, tools that we help to fund is CyberSeq, cyberseek.org, and you may be familiar with it. Um, its latest data, it, it essentially looks at uh, actual job descriptions that are out there, job postings that are out there, and, and, and gathers current workforce data for cybersecurity. And its latest data shows that we are just shy of 600,000 job openings right now with about 45,000 new postings each month. So definitely an active field, definitely a lot of work to be done with, um, they expect about 315,000 new workers need to be added in order to help close the current supply gaps. Um, as this is a space where it's by no means um, decreasing in interest, I, we expect that that's probably going to continue uh, with, you know, currently just shy of 1.2 million workers in cybersecurity related jobs currently in the United States. Um, that the supply demand ratio that they have, that 72% shows that essentially for every 100 jobs that are out there, we have currently about 72 um, individuals to fill those jobs. So, so definitely there's work to be done. Um, I, there, I think I have some more information about CyberSeq going forward, but just to let you know, you can see here that it, it has a heat map of the United States. You can look at specific areas, specific regions, specific states, and see more details about the types of jobs that are being advertised in those locations, as well as those are tied to the NICE framework, and it gives some information about the types of skills people are looking for the, the, for specific jobs. It tells about um, uh, just around the you know salary levels and and certifications required things like that, so it's a really useful tool. Um, so knowing those numbers, we we start to look at what are the, some of the challenges and how can we help to address some of those challenges. Um, one of them is that we do have an aging workforce, and in the federal government, we see that in particular. Uh, and knowing that we will need to be bringing new people in because of uh, uh, this aging workforce and the expectation of retirements, um, that there is growing demand, in both, of course, within federal government, but we see that competition uh, across in, in private industry as well. Um, we uh, unfortunately see low retention for people in these jobs as well. It's some work that NICE is intending to do is, is looking at, you know, why is there low retention? And it's is it simply because of many new opportunities? So people are shifting from one place to another, um, in which case having a defined career growth plan for someone in an organization might help retain those individuals, or it could be burnout. Uh, it could be uh, switching from one career field to another. And, and essentially that's what we're looking at at this point is trying to understand those numbers. 
Um, uh, however, you know, with all of that too, we have the issue that we there are there's typically low availability for entry points uh, for new workers. With a lot of times, we'll see job descriptions requesting you know three to five years of experience and 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 that's not just in the us we see that data internationally as well that that, that tends to be sort of the sweet spot um we're seeing for instance in cyberseek the number of new uh, of job announcements that say that they are for new um hires for, for entry level hires but then requiring those years of experience or requiring certs that actually have those years of experience as, as a mandate and so we're seeing a disconnect and and not being able to bring people into the profession is an issue particularly when we are trying to fill that gap um and it also we see that as an issue too when it comes to diversity um, research has shown that diverse cybersecurity teams mean that they are more effective in being able to address threats and and so having that diversity to make sure that we are the most effective that we can be is important, but also that by doing so, we're opening up the pipeline to a broader uh, number of people and being able to help um, fill those roles that we need filled. And then, of course, in this field, uh, people who are in these positions do need to have um, experience in, and they do need to have skills in ways that other fields may not need. And so if we couple that with a lot of these, it, it makes for a, a more difficult situation. And, and that's where really, though, we can flip into the positive side of things and see, though, yes, there are challenges, but there's also some good things. Um, we know that the demand for workers is high. That could be, you know, it's a double sided coin that could be a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us. We see that that does mean that there's going to be um, work uh, individuals that we could bring into the profession. Um, and some of the, uh, the benefits of doing that is, you know, the work is often well paying mission is attractive um, and the positions can often accommodate remote work and there can be multiple career pathways. So it could be through, um, you know, high school uh, credits that are being done and in, in internships. It could be through 2 year or 4 year institutions and, and pathways into it. It could be non traditional pathways where it's someone uh, perhaps who's um, later on discovered that they want to sort of shift into this and have some skills from on the job training that could be then applied into cybersecurity, for example. And so we're, we're looking at how do we develop out those pathways so that we can have help people come into the profession in many different kinds of ways. Um, this all ties to some work that uh, commerce has done with the Department of Labor around a uh, good jobs principles too. And I, I just am um, there is a resource there that's a it's a good read it, where it talks a bit about what a good job is and we can really see how cybersecurity jobs are good jobs. They're jobs that do um, have benefits that do work with DIA, DIA that are about having that living wage. And, and so there are a number of um, different traits here around what describes good jobs. And that's therefore a resource for you. And so with all that context, that's essentially where the workforce framework comes in. I mentioned that we were first published in 2017. We did a first revision in at the end of 2020. Essentially what it does is it's fairly straightforward and simple. It's, it establishes a common language that describes what a workforce needs to know. Uh, and it does that really at its base level with, with these building blocks of what we call um, really the foundation of the NICE framework. It's the task knowledge and skill statements that are the framework and that's what and we use those to then um, develop work roles and competency areas that can be used in these different kinds of ways around discovery, education, training, planning, assessment and career development. Those those focus areas that NICE has. You can see here right now, this is what it sort of is comprised of. Um, and there's a PDF that describes essentially the structure of the framework and how it can be used. But when people think of the NICE framework, they're really typically thinking of the component pieces that the data sort of behind it and the spreadsheets. And, and that's the that we'll be talking a little bit about more um, in the next slides ahead. Um, there's a lot of times people ask, well, why do we even need a workforce framework? Um, that common language is really important for us to be able to engage with uh, people, uh, sharing that this is a good career field to go into, um, bringing them in, getting them trained up, working with employers, to, uh, making sure there's assessments along the way. 
but at the same time, we also know that it needs to have some attributes that make it useful for use. And, and so the framework is flexible. It's meant to be a starting place. So as you are looking at this and thinking about how you might apply this, um, understanding that this is a starting place, there will be some shifts in, in how you might apply it to your um, own division, your own local, you know, your own personal training, whatever the case may be. Um, but at least it gives you a starting place and, and that common language helps you with that ecosystem engaging with those people. Um, it's also uh, modular. Uh, there are cybersecurity is really interdisciplinary. Uh, our framework looks at cybersecurity specifically. Um, however, there are oftentimes we'll see jobs that engage in other kinds of areas, other domains. So, for instance, here at NIST, there's a workforce framework for privacy that's in development that's using the same structure. And we'll be able to see those statements that are privacy specific statements that are important to cybersecurity and be able to pull those directly in because of that modularity and vice versa. They're looking at our content and see what cybersecurity aspects need to be put into their framework. So rather than introducing redundancy, we're going to be able to have that in, um, modularity and that interoperability, which is the next attribute between these frameworks. Another example is work that's happening currently at NSF to develop a workforce framework for AI for a scholarship for um, service students. And then and there's agility. Uh, when we did revised the NICE framework in 2020, we did so with this attribute in mind, understanding that this is not a static field, of course, and that we will need to be responsive to change. And so that means incorporating updated statements around things like um, uh, automation and how that might have an impact on the cybersecurity work that happens, understanding that there may be new work roles that need to be developed. Um, it's also where what when we um, revised in 2020, it's also why we introduced competency areas. And I'll, sh I'll share a little bit more about those in the next slides. Before I jump into those, though, I did want to take a moment to explain how this, how we work with the various stakeholders and how they engage with the NICE framework. So we define the work roles. We define the work to be done and, and what knowledge and skills people need. Um, but we don't do that in a vacuum. We do that being informed by employers who are identifying that content for us. And we do that with um, with working with the educators to help teach to and evidence that capability. Um, it's the learners who are working with us to help uh, to develop themselves to to possess these capabilities to also use it, the framework to demonstrate their capabilities too. And so it really does require all of us to engage together. And, and it means that we are reflecting what's out there. We're looking at research that's happening at NIST and outside of NIST. Um, we're really focusing on what subject matter experts like yourselves are telling us so that we can incorporate it into the framework um, rather than us coming and saying, okay, we've, we've discovered something and you have to now do it. It's really meant to be <clears throat> a very um, engaged kind of community that helps develop out the framework. And it's for that reason that it's more effective as well, because we are doing that being informed by real use. And it's for that reason that we see the value in with all of these different stakeholders. So we're seeing how employers value its use because it does offer an avenue to help broaden that pipeline and increase diversity. I wish I've sort of mentioned before, um, it's oftentimes used to create job descriptions and to develop candidate assessments. Uh, a lot, we will hear from employers who are using it to track their workforce, to identify their current workforce and who's there and what kinds of responsibilities they have in order to make sure that there's, um, whether it's for compliance purposes or if it's for strategic purposes or development purposes of the of the um, cybersecurity program, um, they're able to, by using the NICE framework, better understand what that workforce is and its capabilities. And then, of course, to help develop employees too, to make sure that there is that continuous growth that's so important. Um, for learners, I think I've touched a little bit about the, on this, but it's essentially the discovery, development, and demonstration components. 
And then we work with educators and, and I'm using that very broadly here, everything from K-12 to higher ed to training and service providers and certification providers. Um, but they uh, are using the NICE framework and, and, and as, as well as service providers to things like ranges and, and CTFs. Um, they're using the framework to develop learning courses or develop um, different competitions and, and all of those kinds of things using the NICE framework to address uh, employer needs and to be able to help people um, essentially test themselves and be able to uh, uh, show their capability. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of those uh, aligning their instruction with the NICE framework too, to essentially be able to evidence and, and be more transparent as to what their instruction is um, so that it's not just, that, oh, I, I should believe that this is a good degree is that now I know what this degree is. I know how that ties to a work role because of that alignment. And of course, to develop assessments. Um, I should note too that uh, the framework is used in government at all levels, is used in public and private sectors across industries and in academia, as well as internationally. And we're not doing this in isolation. You all may be more familiar with some of these other kinds of frameworks that are out there, and, and there are ties to these others. This is just a smattering of them. It's not by any means complete, but um, you may be familiar. I mentioned some of the existing other frameworks that are around there. Um, one that you're probably more familiar with is the, the DCWF, and there's a very good relationship that we have with that, and you could see that there's a lot of um, overlap between those because of the way that we, we these have been developed. And so um, we can see that the, the knowledge and skill statements and the task statements are, are similar in both of those. Um, there's also with the, uh, the CAEs, the um, uh, Centers for Academic Excellence Institutions and their knowledge units, there's a mapping between those and the NICE framework components. We also tie in with, of course, with other NIST publications, for instance, in this cybersecurity framework, which essentially defines what an organization should be doing in order to um, minimize risk, where we then go take that from is where they describe the what, we then look at the, the who and the how. And that's essentially putting into practice what they're saying should be done. It's then, okay, we agree that we need our, as an organization to do this, how's that gonna happen? And that's where the NICE framework comes in. And we do have those relationship with these other frameworks here as well, and are starting to build out new content based on some of this. So, for instance, the AI risk management framework or the secure software development framework and seeing how we can uh, develop out content based on what was in those frameworks. I mentioned we also have international engagement and we have very close connections with a number of, and this is just again a few of them, but a number of international frameworks for cybersecurity workforce. So we're seeing much more coordination um, there, particularly as we're seeing that, of course, uh, cybersecurity is an international concern and, and oftentimes we're working with multinational um, industry organizations. So, so having that common, common um, language there is really helpful. And then there's some alignments and mappings and, and just to give you a little bit more information, I've linked, provided here some links to those alignments and mappings. So if you wanted to take a look at them a little bit more later, you could. I also want to point out a few tools that are out there. Um, these are just a handful of ones. There's also a number of uh, services that are out there that uh, use a nice framework, um, but these ones you might be more familiar with uh, that are, I, I mentioned CyberSeq earlier. Um, you may also be familiar with the um, Nix Career Pathways tool, which uses all those little uh, and that's on the top right there. All those little circles are each of those are nice framework work roles. And if you click on one, it shows the connections to others to help sort of develop out those pathways. Um, there's a job mapping tool. There's a search tool. A nice challenge project, which includes um, challenges for students. It's free for um, education use. Um, we have things like Mill Gears that has used the nice framework as well. So there are a number of tools that are out there as, that are, are using the NICE framework. So we're seeing that again, that common language that helps bring these different, um, bring to bear uh, uh, this ecosystem. So now let me go ahead and, and dive a little bit more into these components. I've been talking about them, but I haven't really shared them or showed them. So let's let's tell you a little bit more about those for those of you who aren't familiar with it. 
Um, as I had stated before, essentially the, the foundation of the framework is these nice framework building blocks, the, the task knowledge and skill statements. So the task statements are statements that describe work to be done. And the skill and knowledge statements are essentially what someone who's going to be doing that work needs to know or be able to do to complete those tasks. So it's really very simple. Um, our task statements tend to be fairly broad in nature uh, so that they can be applied. They are industry agnostic. They are, um, you know, they could be used in manufacturing and in healthcare and in defense and in, you know, pretty much everywhere. And so they tend to be a bit high level, um, but they are a good starting place for an organization to understand who's responsible for work and, and how are we going to make sure that people have those capabilities to do that work. And that's really what the work rules and the competency areas are. So the work rules are at its base. It's the groups of task statements that someone or a group would be available or would be responsible for. Um, the competency areas I mentioned are fairly new. We are right now finalizing what those are, but that's more looking at the learner and sort of their knowledge and skill. And I'll spend a little bit more time explaining that. We also share in our document how these can be used to create teams, um, but it's really the work roles, which are most uh, heavily used with the NICE framework. And then I think the competency areas coming forward. So just to clarify when we use the word work role it's intentional versus a job or a position because a work role is just an area of responsibility and it is not the same thing as a job it can be there are times that for instance you might be uh, hiring someone for vulnerability assessment and we have a work role for that it can be a one for one but you can have a job that has more than one work role. So you might have a couple that are sort of built together. Um, and in addition, we're seeing these work roles, not just in traditional sort of cybersecurity jobs that you might think of, however, but also in spaces that where people have cybersecurity responsibility or need of cybersecurity um, knowledge and skills for their work. So for instance, in policy development or in legal or in um, some of the governance and oversight kind of positions where they may need to have some of that capability. Um, as digital is such a big thing, being able to recognize that people who are working in the digital space will need to have some cybersecurity um, uh, responsibility of some kind, that's really where we're focusing in on. So it can be added into any a number of different kinds of jobs. We have been working on updating all of our content since we revised our publication in 2020. And these are the uh, updated work role categories we'll be coming out with in the next month or so. Um, these were out, put out for comment earlier, and this is where we are at this point. Um, I've given here some examples of the 52 work roles that we do have across these different seven categories. Uh, essentially, the first four categories are the ones that we'll see a lot of heavy usage. It's, um, and you can see it's the kind of work, and a lot of times these categories is really helpful in terms of understanding sort of your where you would maybe get started. So are you in maybe more of a managerial kind of oversight role that we've got a category with oversight and governance? And you could see some examples of the, the roles in that space include policy and planning, security control assessment, so broader kinds of um, oversight kinds of roles. We also then have the design and development. And for that, and for us, that's really important because we understand that cybersecurity is not something that happens after the fact only. It's really built into those design and development processes as well. It needs to be incorporated throughout that whole life cycle. And so we have um, roles in that space and the cybersecurity concerns that they would need to pay, be att paying attention to. And then there are implementation and operation types of work roles and then protection and defense kinds of work roles. And those are the ones that you might think of as more traditional cybersecurity work roles. Finally, we have three different categories that are more specialized for um, 
uh, government purposes. We have our investigation work roles, which tend to fall into some FBI, DOJ kinds of areas, intelligence work roles, which tend to be more CIA kind of work, and then the cyber effects, which tend to be our uh, military um, applications specific there. And my screen, there we go. To look a little bit more detail at a couple of our work roles, I've just pulled three out here. Uh, so one of them is incident response. And you can see that the work role name and description is fairly broad and minimal um, at the same time. You know, it's, it's one sentence describing what this work role is. It's really those task knowledge and skills. We list abilities here too. Those are being refactored um, as we speak as, as updated knowledge and skill statements. Um, the, the, that's really where you get into the detail of what this work is. So you might start thinking broadly and like, I'm gonna start at that category. I know I'm looking at protection and defense kinds of roles. I know I'm looking at an incident responder, um, but then what is that responder meant to be doing? And, and that's really where you get into the tasks and those um, knowledge and skills as if what that person needs to be able to know and be able to do in order to complete those tasks. So that's where the detail really hits it. Um, and, and so we'll see that, and you, you can see it, it varies according to different kinds of roles. So with the systems management role, we see a larger number of tasks simply because the types of work that might fall into that role are much more varied. And this is where you, it, that flexible application really comes in. That one organization, you might have an individual or team who's doing all of this at a smaller organization, a small business. It's, you might see someone who's doing a portion of what the tasks in this area are. Um, just a couple of these example tasks, and I know it's getting small there, but um, include uh, providing technical documents, reports, and findings to higher headquarters. Um, another is uh, recommending resource allocations or overseeing policy standards and implementation strategies for policy. So depending on the organization, it may be that one person's responsible for all this. It might be a single team's responsible for all this, or it may be that you're only responsible for a subset of what's in here. And and, and that's that's where that flexible application comes in. And we could see too that threat analysis um, has the 29 tasks, so sort of in the middle of sort of those, and then with about 32 knowledge, skills, and abilities. So in this case, you might think that perhaps those knowledge, skills, and abilities are a little bit more um, specific to that field. It's not as broad. It's more uh, focused in in that one area of domain. So uh, there is some information about using the work rules. Uh, there, there had been previously legislation requiring a federal use of the NICE framework work rules, um, and there is useful information that's out there about assigning work rule codes. Um, and and there's are a lot of benefits to making sure that you do that as any new job description happens, and as you update your own job descriptions, making sure that there you take a look and understand what those work rule codes are so that you can um, really sort of understand not only you know, your own career pathway, but for your staff who and for your hiring and HR, so to be able to understand who is responsible for what and perhaps what gaps you have. Um, the, the earlier legislation, the, the, um, the Federal Cyber Workforce Assessment Act, FCWAA, also required uh, annual reporting of work roles of critical need. And that way an organization could understand what was really needed in that and then and then be able to specifically work on filling those roles and so that's really only can be done by understanding the current workforce and understanding what's there so that that was a, a real good benefit of actually um uh making sure that these codes are applied across the entire workforce and you know it helped with justifying actions to retain or gain critical skills that supported training and development so it's a lots of really good outcomes in, in being able to understand what the the workforce is um i i also have here an example use of of hiring um a lot of times what we'll hear from employers that some of the challenges they they've uh, dealt with and that they're trying to address is when they aren't really sure what their workforce needs are or 
they don't have a detailed position description, and that's oftentimes because their HR department may not be a cybersecurity expert, and so there's a need for um, understanding how do we uh, does how do we share with HR what should be included in a PD, and 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 um, and that's really one one major use of the nice framework, um, and it's also about setting realistic goals and and really focusing on more of that skills based hiring as well, and so. Um, we do have, this came out this last year, uh, an employer's guide to writing effective cybersecurity job descriptions that can help with that. And in there, it's uh, not only helps to define your hiring ecosystem and essentially get started with making sure you've got your hiring manager, HR, recruitment, you know, all of those people that you might need to have as part of that ecosystem. So it's a, it's uh, working together in order to, to make sure that you have a good candidate pool and hiring process. And there's some resources in here on how to use the NICE framework to create those PDs and also how you can then create candidate assessments. And it gives some examples um, assessment tools there too. I did want to point out that uh, USA Jobs does have a special field for adding in work role codes so that if someone were in a university and, and getting a degree, and they understand that their courses have been focused because they, they align to the NICE framework, they understand their courses have been focused on a particular work role, and then they can see in USA Jobs because you've added in that work role code that um, th there's a connection there that makes a nice immediate connection that you know you're gonna get someone who's able to um, fill into that role pretty quickly. So for instance, with this first one, we're seeing um, out of the, uh, um, I think it's out of DOJ, what we're seeing is someone was adding in that they needed to have, uh, this is for work role codes for the cybercrime investigator and cyber defense forensics analysis. That's who they were looking for, someone with those who had those two capabilities and would be doing the work of those two work roles. And then under VA, we're seeing that they were looking for hiring, and this is this is a couple months old now, but um, hiring a position that for a system security analyst. And so by doing that, you know, they're going to have some of the requirements of the jobs, some of the responsibilities, but for someone who's in that kind of work right now, they're able to then go to the NICE framework and see specifically what the work is and what the requirements are, what they're going to need to be able to do to do this job. And then I think by having that, you're able to see a, a greater improvement in terms of um, getting the right candidates for these positions. Um, I, I mentioned that in addition to work roles, we have introduced competency areas. There is some res there are some resources on our site about what those are because they are fairly new. Essentially, the reason why we introduced these is for a few reasons. One was evolving recruiting practices. I was mentioning sort of the need for that broader applicant pool and and shifting into more of a skills based approach and making sure that uh, there's candidates for some emerging areas. Um, it, it helps with assessment based hiring and promotion. It helps with our extending the nice framework beyond just those more um, mature work roles, more static kinds of work roles, perhaps, um, and to be able to sort of look at where are their current gaps in, in what we have in the framework and what are those emerging areas. It gave us a way to incorporate those as they're still in development. And it also helps with uh, education and training providers as they're starting to need to teach to some of these areas. So they can be used with our work roles. We might, we oftentimes will see some that can be applied onto existing work roles. Um, they can be used independently. They're sometimes they span multiple work roles, but the main thing is that these are not meant to duplicate our work roles. They're, they're an additive to the NICE framework. And so we are currently, this is what we're looking at. And um, we did recently um, produce a second draft of our proposed areas and there were 15. It looks like um, based on our comments that we received during our open comment period, we'll probably scale back and, and drop a few of those. So it looks like we'll probably be more at uh, 13 um, in terms of when we finally release. But some of the ones you'll see is like AI security. And so this is the security of AI. We will be looking at using AI in cybersecurity, but we'll do that through knowledge and skill and task statements. So this is securing AI. And so it's, an, it's a newer area, obviously. It's a lot of hype around it right now, a lot of interest in this space. So we've been engaged with this. 
but we understand there's a need for cybersecurity when it comes to AI. And so as that field's evolving, we want to, and so the, the work roles and the work to be done are still not quite as stable enough for us to include as work roles. But so as it's evolving, we didn't want to be remiss and not include this in the framework. And so by putting it out to the knowledge and skills that someone who would be working in that field might need to possess, we're able to start moving in that direction. That's the same with cloud, although I think there is a case to be made for cloud specific work roles. But for instance, with some of like the networking um, positions, we'll see that those can be applied whether or not you're in a cloud based environment. Um, and so a existing work role might require in addition, um, those that cloud security domain expertise and in other places it may not. It, and it adds some flexibility to how we apply the framework there. Um, we also have ones around communication, security, data privacy, specific cryptography. There's a lot of work in that space right now at NIST. And so these are ones we're starting with and we'll be developing out this year. Um, and one of the things that I think we'll see more as, uh, as we're moving forward to is more work with education and career pathways. We've done some work in that space and, and you saw some tools that talk about this um, earlier as well. We came out last year with a, a resource around identifying multiple career pathways to build a diverse cybersecurity workforce. We will be looking at how can we develop that out more using the NICE framework. Um, we are intending to develop a proficiency scale that could be applied at the work role and competency area level. So if you're looking at those kinds of work roles that may be more um, typically available for entry level, we'll be able to sort of identify those as well as pathways of once you're in, how can you maybe move among different kinds of work roles but also considering again that there are many pathways. So if you have already people in your organization who might be interested in cybersecurity, giving them a pathway over into cybersecurity to make that lateral move, for example. And here are some of the tools I did wanna point out. Um, this is the next tool I referenced earlier, and you can see that sort of roadmap information they have. Uh, just this last year, um, in the, I think fall it was, they did add in for a handful of the different work roles. Uh, this challenges that are kind of a fun approach for people who are interested in understanding more what a day in the life of, of one of these work roles might be. And it's a sort of an interactive uh, as if you were an intern in an in area and they're like, okay, so today this is what we're gonna be working on. And it sort of gets you, it's like a little mini challenge. Um, and so those can be of interest for people who are looking at, hey, I might want to, I'm doing systems admin, but I might want to be moving into incident response. Like I can maybe try out that incident responder one and sort of see how that would be. And, and if that's something that what I'd be interested in. Um, and here's some more details about um, uh, CyberSeq also has some career pathways. And here's some more examples of how they play it out, as well as looking at a particular job that they will say um, that they'll highlight. You could see there some common job titles for that job. You could see how it connects to the NICE framework and, and some of the additional information that they provide, including the skills that are being looked at and, and you know, both, both the top ones being requested and the top future ones that, we, that they anticipate will be needed in that space. Uh, just to note, to add, sort of getting towards the end, and then we'll um, open up for some questions. We are, as I mentioned, really been working on updating the framework. So we expect to have uh, all new updated statements for release. We're looking as early as the end of February and knock on wood, um, trying to really stick with that. And so that includes all the updated knowledge and skill statements. We had seen that there was some redundancy and lack of clarity. So we cleaned up all of those. Um, our task statements are open for comment right now. We've got a handful of days left of that comment period. And once that closes, we'll update those and then we'll have a full updated release of our components. So including the statements, including updated work roles and work role categories and the confirmed competency areas. And that will be out in, um, again, end of February. Um, in addition to reviewing our existing work roles this year, we also are looking at introducing new work roles and would love to be hear from you if there are work roles that aren't represented or things that maybe need to be addressed. So um, we have one that will be coming out with that February release around insider threat analysis. 
um, very shortly, we're going to be releasing one for comment on OT cybersecurity engineering. And you could see that we have a number of others that we're looking at. Um, we'll also be developing out those competency areas. And I mentioned that proficiency scale. And then finally, uh, you may be aware of the White House Office of the National Cyber Director uh, strategy that came out in uh, July of last year. It's a National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy, and we've been very closely working with them around that. Um, I am in particular in, engaged in the um, working group around Pillar 4, which is strengthening the federal cyber workforce and understanding how we can help support that. But the NICE framework and the NICE office is really involved in all four pillars. So it goes from equipping every American with foundational cyber skills uh, to transforming cyber education and then expanding and enhancing the work America's cyber workforce and then the federal workforce. And so I know that there's an implementation strategy um, that's currently uh, being finalized. And so there is going to be some more information coming out on that uh, very shortly. And then finally, uh, I, what we do needs to be done with the community. It's it's based on your needs, on your expectations, and how we can support it. There are a number of ways to engage with us. I encourage you to go to our site and and take a look at these, or send me an email. And and if you've got questions about how to engage, but it's based on how can we help support you, and how can what you do help inform our efforts as well. And so with that, there will be here in the slides, I know you'll be getting a copy of this, um, uh, links to all sorts of information you could see at the NICE Framework Resource Center, a lot of content that we have. Here are some of the tools I highlighted today, but I will go ahead and leave it there and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for that. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, guys doing a good, lot of great work over there. We do have some questions in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll read those out loud um, now and give you the opportunity to answer them. Um, and anybody else, if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to uh, put those in the chat. The Q&A is now open. Um, one of the first questions we have from Eric, he says, we often have a disconnect in the certification versus competence of workers. People have accredited certificates, but no practical experience, no analysis yeah. capability. The three to five year requirement usually because we need people to have the ability to perform basic tasks, which certification is not providing. Are there any provisions for formal education at the postgraduate level that is actually trustworthy? And 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 that's we definitely hear that all the time. It's the yeah, you may know it in theory, but I need to get you to have practical hands-on experience. And and so I think what we're seeing is an increased um, effort by. Uh, education certification providers to incorporate that uh, you'll see that most of the sort of competition CTFs that are out there are aligned to the nice framework and we're seeing much heavier use of that in courses and by aligning or um, ident or identifying how that content how coursework is tied to the framework it's sort of making it more transparent and so if I look and I see that you've got a cert or you've got a degree that doesn't really mean much to me, but if I then see, okay, in this, you were able to complete these tasks, for example, I know that you had some hands on, even if it's in, you know, in a classroom environment, some hands on experience of applying those knowledge and skills towards real work that would happen in the workplace. This isn't just a standardized test. This is an actual task that would happen in a specific work role in the workforce. And so by having that connection, it's really sort of introducing that hands on nature of things. But it also then helps those employ helps you from the employer perspective say, hey, I see that you've got this cert and that's aligned to this work role. Let me go ahead and assess you and say, OK, I'm hiring for this area of work and this is sort of the kind of work that we do. I'm going to build out an assessment on making sure that you can understand how um, you can uh, demonstrate your capability in being able to do this. But we're also seeing a lot of shifts where so it's not just sort of that skills based assessment. So not prioritizing the certifications as much or um, uh, and, and being able to sort of or maybe do both and when it comes to that. But we're also seeing a lot more interest in things like apprenticeships and um, making sure that there are learning opportunities on the job as well. So we'll hear from employers who say, I want to bring someone in because they have my um, the domain knowledge of my organization of, of this part of what I'm doing, or you know, I, they have some basic thing, but I'm going to 
make sure in those first three months I've got training specific to what this job is that they have. So it's sort of hiring with that uh, buffer period of sorts, rather than needing them to just hit the ground running. Thank you. Uh, next question from Eric as well. When it comes to cybersecurity, there's a large barrier of entry due to level of access to classified information and NDAs in the commercial field. Mm -hmm. How do certificate providers attempt to provide training without access to that information? That's a, another one that comes up a lot of times is really not only the access requirements, but really just the, the logistics of even getting clearance and, and had the length of time that that takes. I know that's a big barrier and that's something that we've been working with. Um, if that federal workforce group is something that has been addressed there. Um, it, I, I don't have an answer myself. I think probably I could point you to some of our agencies who are actually having to deal with that and how they've been doing it more. Um, but it is, I know, an, an ongoing issue of concern. And, and so it's something that having your feedback and, and sharing and be part of those conversations would be really helpful to understand how can we address that because it is still something that we're having to deal with sorry not a not a great answer there and our last question from eric you mentioned low job retention does a nice framework address competency disconnect leading to the imposter syndrome given the salary levels for even entry level position companies are not willing to take the risk of on the job learning requirements I, I missed that last part. So, uh, companies are willing to take the risk. Take the risk of an on-the-job learning requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I do think that that's definitely happening more. Is uh, making sure that there is that on-the-job kind of training that happens, um, simply because. I mean, there's always with any kind of new position, you're not going to have someone who comes in and knows how, everything straight away. There's always going to be some of that. So being intentional about that is um, and making sure that you're able to build people up in the in the first maybe again it could be a month it could be three months depending on what it is i think is an important part of the process but when it comes to retention we i think the career paths is another area that's really starting to help with that um by not just hiring someone and then just saying okay i got you in the door let's leave it there it's making sure that you've got ongoing training because this is not a static field this is one that requires that ongoing learning that you can go ahead and continue to develop your employees as well as give them those pathways so that you're not going to necessarily have someone who's doing it support for the rest of their career but you're going to give them pathways into those higher level kinds of positions and continue them forward so that you're not losing staff as much so it's that it's making sure you've got a really active um, pipeline into and not only into the door, but also through uh, um, going, going through your organization. So to develop them out into those areas that you might need more of. And that's that we're seeing that as being helpful with retention. It's, it's not just the, in the door. Mentoring also can be really helpful um, and, and oftentimes we'll see that from, you know, making sure you've got mentors who aren't in your division so that you've got that sort of a, some, maybe some in parallel. There are things like job shadowing that can be helpful as well, and, but just really offering opportunities. Our next question from Jeff, in addition to recruiting, hiring, training, development, does NICE directly support any specific DOD cyber workforce retention efforts? We don't, um, and and so what we do is really we're out there as a resource to help and to be used by, but when it comes to like a specific DoD um, retention effort, that would be then looking at your HR or, or um, you know if you're hiring um, manager kind of roles and seeing how are they maybe using the Nice framework to help support that. So. We're part of the conversation, but we're not doing the direct support for agency specifically. All right. Our next question from Carl. I'll be keen to get direction to the research you referred to earlier that supports the notion that diverse cyber teams work better. And when you mentioned diversity, exactly what are you referring to? Gender, race, age, all the above. Or personality. Yeah. Uh, location, um, economic status, you know, ever everything. It, it really is that that full range of diversity um, that that includes there. There are we do have on our website some information around um, DIA resources. We also have you know there's a lot of information on our site that we try to pull together. 
um, but but yeah, we we're taking a broad perspective of that, and I could certainly see if I can't point you um, to some of those researchers uh, so you could see that. But um, generally, that's what we've been hearing, particularly when we understand that the people who are acting as uh, threats, whether it's um, nation state threats or uh, individuals, um, aren't going to be necessarily just the the traditional sort of white man kind of things. It's just going to be diverse. It's going to be coming from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic, different reasons as to why they're they're being a threat. Um, and so being able to have different perspectives on how they are um, trying to do attacks can be really helpful in terms of responding to those or anticipating those attacks. Thank you. Our next question from Kurt. I noticed the definition for the word task, an activity that is directed toward the achievement of organization objectives. Relative to the KSA acronym, it seems clear that the TKS acronym emphasizes the task dimension. In other words, the job or the responsibility for a cyber job requires the performance of a task. On the other hand, the ability dimension from the KSA acronym is relative to the capabilities of a person, quote unquote. Right. Therefore, TKS is a term that is necessary and sufficient for the purposes of the NICE framework. In short, TKS is focused on the job requirements. Do you agree? Yeah, uh, and so so um, uh, we had with our 2017 publication had knowledge, skill, and ability statements. Um, the community, based on lots of conversations and open calls, were pointing out that ability statements were oftentimes redundant with sometimes straight up duplicative duplicative with. Um, our skill statements, and there was really unclear as to what's the difference between a skill and ability. And um, where ability is just that you're able to do the skill. Why? Well, I not? I want. I want you to do the skill. Like <laughs> so. So we, based on feedback, removed our ability statements. Um, we refactored them essentially. So where there was unique content, we made sure that they were identified as either knowledge or skill statements. So right now, the the current version of the Nice Framework is task, knowledge, and skill. Um, and you're right. I think it is more of that focus on the task. It's really looking at that work to be done. We, I think that's a really core component of workforce frameworks is this isn't a theoretical. This is a on the job workforce framework. And so we wanted to really prioritize that and work with the employers to be able to highlight that work that needs to be done. Um, it's also, you know, I, I think there is importance and understanding that this is not going to be we are updating them and we are going to be adding more and, and shifting things that these are going to need to be uh, regularly maintained and and so you know i don't want to we don't want to say that in five years it's it, nothing's going to change we're going to keep the same so that is going to be an ongoing changing kind of environment as well and all right um our next question comes from Mark. He says, do you have any plans to expand your scope to include if to include system security engineering roles per NIST 800 160 volumes one and two? We had a call actually just uh, it may have been Tuesday. I was gonna say yesterday, but I think it was Tuesday. Um we've had we've had a couple calls around that specifically. And um our uh, the most recent one we were talking about that and uh, I think there's a question of whether or not that works better as a competency area or as a work role. And so we are looking at that and seeing how we can incorporate that, but it, um, we're still determining how that would be best addressed. Um, one of the things that I think we're going to have struggle with is that we really want to be able to extend in a lot of, the, there's a lot I think that needs to be extended too, but it's just about resources and capability. So we're, we're wanting to make sure that we are doing it. Um, in a very collaborative way with subject matter experts helping inform us. And so we're um, establishing right now a process on how do we prioritize development of which roles? So how do we choose which roles to start with, for example? But that's definitely on our list and it's just, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to approach it. And our next question says, some of the DOD related jobs need a certain level of security clearance. How do we prepare for this type of higher level job without the current employer support? And then that's going to be again, I think, more specific around, you know, DOD specific practices and how um, HRs and uh, hiring managers are going to be dealing with that and through some of that federal workforce um, working group out of ONC sort of addressing that. But that's a little bit outside of what we're able to address. And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that. So my apologies there. Okay. Um, and our next question from Aiden says, can you go back to slide eight? 
Uh, I think the presentation that we download is missing info. So maybe something with. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find out. I'll do a quick share and the way the PDF may describe which one it was just so I can. Slide eight. I'm going to share here and, and try to get us back to I'm not sure which one's eight. So I'm going to go back to the front and then. <laughs> sorry, this is a little crazy here. Heck, okay, so we're, here we go. One, the screenshots two, for this three, four, special five, publication, seven. 800. Is it the, oh, this one? Yep. Yes, correct. So essentially, the PDF this, may have uh, rendered a little a little weird, maybe. I, I'm sorry. What was that? Um, the PDF may have uh, rendered a little weird, so may have oh, messed up the okay. image or something yep. like that. So that's why. So, so essentially, what this is is um. So, yeah, it really just shows that what the framework is is that PDF that describes the structure of the framework. That's that's more, that's the more static side of things. We don't anticipate a lot of changes happening with the structure of the, the of, of the framework. In um, we're looking at maybe making some adjustments, but that's going to be more static. But then the component pieces and the sort of data that supports it, that's the spreadsheet. It's currently a spreadsheet. I should note that when we update it and release it, we are looking to uh, move it to an online platform for easier intake and use, as well as for distribution. So it will still be available, um, exportable as a spreadsheet, but also as JSON, and we're looking at other kinds of formats and versions. And so if there's something that would be useful for you, either with um, uh, how you can access it, or in terms of tools that would be helpful in terms of using that, we, that's what we'd really like to hear because we're starting to shift in that direction of being able to see how can we support or add in additional uses to make it so it's more um, user friendly, essentially. Thank you. Um, and we're right at one o'clock, and I believe that uh, that is all the questions we have today. Uh, I'd like to thank Karen again for the presentation. Um, please check back uh, within a couple of days to the CSI webinar announcement. We will be posting uh, the recording for this webinar, or you can go directly to the CSI YouTube page as well. Um, we'll be posting the recording there as well. Um, and hopefully, we see you next month for our, our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having joining us today and, and having me here. Yep, no problem.